You are tuning into the Lehigh Low Ego High Impact Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Volkan Emre, along with a dynamic team of Kellogg School of Management alums. They are here on a shared mission to uncover the mindset that drives impact and success. On Lehigh, we have talked provoking conversations with incredibly successful entrepreneurs, business leaders, and investors from around the globe. We uncover the mindset that drives them, allowing them to make a high impact without losing themselves to ego. Now, let's get started with today's episode. Today, we have a very special episode with Professor Mohan Birsani, a globally recognized scholar, consultant, speaker, and author in technology, innovation, and marketing. He is a distinguished professor at the Kellogg School of Management of Northwestern University, and he is an advisor to global Fortune 500 companies. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mohan Birsani to the Lehigh Mindset Podcast. Welcome, Professor Sani. It's an honor to have you with us on the Lehigh Low Ego High Impact Mindset Podcast. Fantastic to be talking to you. So I really appreciate the time. I will start with some rapid fire questions to get us warmed up. Wonderful. Let's do it. Okay. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Dogs or cats? Cats. Mountains or beaches? Mountains. Text or cold? Text. (laughs) I wasn't expecting that. (laughs) Oh, um, music or podcast? Music. Music. Um, PC or Mac? PC, PC, PC. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Drive or fly? Fly. Fly. Okay. What's worse, dishes or laundry? Dishes. <laughs> okay. Um, what is the first app you open when you begin your day? Weather. Weather app. Great. So, um, Professor... Uh, could you start by telling us about like your role um, at Kellogg? So at Kellogg, I um, wear multiple hats. You know, um, I am on the faculty uh, in marketing, uh, so I have a clinical appointment in marketing. So I teach courses in the marketing department. I teach product management and technology marketing. Um, in addition to that, I am the director for the Center for Research in Technology and Innovation. And what we do at that center is uh, work with technology companies to both create and knowledge and to disseminate knowledge, including custom executive education, as well as collaborative research projects. So that's my second role. And uh, then my third role is um, to, in an administrative capacity, I serve as the Associate Dean for Digital Innovation at Kellogg, where my charter is to uh, to look at the landscape of technology and its implications for teaching, learning, and how we run our school and how we engage with our constituents. So we do due diligence of technologies and vendors, we do uh, proof of concepts, and then we work with the operating units to scale up the initiatives. So those are the three things that I do. I am I, I, a teacher, and I am a director of a research center, as well as I'm on the senior leadership team at Kellogg. I think you're objectively in a very um, tough role at Kellogg because um, the keeping up with innovation and adapting this innovation like to a world-class faculty uh, and institution um, like Kellogg, I, I believe it brings a lot of like weight on your shoulder. How do you um, keep up with the changes? And actually, it, in your case, it's not keeping up with the changes. It's actually being ahead of like what's coming next. Right. So, uh, and I think this is probably like the DNA like you have and you always had. How do you um, maintain relevance, like in this particular tough spot? That's an excellent question. You know, and I get asked that a lot. That how do you keep up? How do you? And as you said, not let's keep up, but stay ahead. Uh, and I see that on a number of dimensions. For instance, you know, I've been teaching um, 
generative AI executive program to Microsoft, to Salesforce. So yeah. who are the leaders in that space? So I have to know something they don't know. Um, so it's a, and 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 as you can appreciate, the, the half-life of knowledge is shrinking. Technology is advancing at faster and faster paces. Just look at, you know, since November 30th of 2022, um, how the whole generative AI space has exploded and the pace of development. So it is, uh, it is a bit tiring and uh, to 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 keep up to speed. Um, but it's also exhilarating to be at the cutting edge because it was to me, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way. And um, the way to respond to this, I will broaden the question because I think this question has relevance not only for me as an individual but for all. You know, people who are at business school or are in, in your careers, how do you stay ahead? How do you stay abreast of the the changes? So, um, a few techniques or tips or or, or, or things that work for me. Um, the first thing that I do, and I would recommend a lot of you do, is is I I say get out of the building, and get out of the building and um, spend time in the field. I spend a lot of time with startup companies. I spend a lot of time working with the big tech companies on boards, on advisory boards, on consulting and speaking engagements. Um, because entrepreneurs teach me what's new. You know, the big tech companies teach me what they are working on. So, uh, so I spend probably a third of my time in front of uh, people who are at the cutting edge of technology. So I also read a lot and uh, and in reading you know you 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 define your listening post you create your listening post so i follow medium i follow business insider i follow the verge and you know and i you know uh, some podcasts and so on so you have to sort of create your own personal learning agenda based on uh, these these information sources also uh, i think it's important to meet different types of people. I like to say, you know, meet weird people, read weird books, go to weird conferences, hug an engineer, right? I mean, so even within your, because we spend too much time with people like us and that's what you want to uh, to avoid. So it's really about, you know, creating a variety of listening posts and um, having that proactive hunger to to keep learning. And in fact, I would recommend that all of us set aside some time, even whether it's like half an hour a day or, 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 or you know, a day every two weeks where you say, I'm just going to spend time stepping back and learning because that learning is going to become more and more important as uh, knowledge advances faster and faster. One of my questions was actually is about the mindset, like which mindset you have, I think, in I think you have highlighted like some hints about like your mindset in general, mm -hmm. um, and how would you then define uh, your mindset that made you Mohammed Sani in the past? I will say three, four decades, um, starting in India and now uh, being in this position, leading in a really world class institution, not only in the US uh, but also in other geographical locations um what how can you summarize like your mindset uh, with your own words so i think when i think about mindset one of the things i articulated was the importance of learning but let me put a finer point on that one very important aspect of my mindset and i think it is useful for a lot of people, is the notion of reinventing yourself every few years. You know, if you've been in your comfort zone for too long, if you feel comfortable at work, if you feel everything is under control, you're not pushing fast, fast enough or you're driving, not driving hard enough. So what you need to do is to actually push yourself out of your comfort zone and, uh, and pursue new areas of competence, new jobs, new roles, um, just kind of challenging yourself uh, to be uncomfortable, to learn new things. You know, I'll take you back over three decades and uh, 
give you a few examples to make this idea more concrete. When I joined Kellogg in 1993, 90, at that time, you know, the World Wide Web and HTML and Netscape, just there were some early glimmers of uh, that, that there was something significant happening here. So I figured out that, that this is big and this is interesting and I know nothing about this space. So I jumped in and I said, I'm going to become an expert in this World Wide Web, HTML. And I played with the tools I learned about and I started writing about it. And that was sort of one of the, some of the earliest writings that I did was on, was on e-commerce and B2B e-commerce and the emerging models. So that really consumed me for, I think, a good five years. And um, following which I saw that now we were shifting to another very interesting next level, which is e-commerce, right? So now it's not just about content, but about commerce. Uh, so then I started to build my competencies in e-commerce and thinking about sort of that space. Then we saw an evolution towards mobility and mobile commerce, and then we had AI, and then we had generative AI. So what I try to do is kind of identify weak signals, and this is an important observation, that the universe only sends you weak signals of opportunity. You have to have an antenna listening and, and detecting those early signals and then getting ahead by by really saying, I'm going to reinvent myself. So to give you a very specific recent example, generative AI, I saw this happening. Um, when my first exposure to chat GPT was just a month after it was launched. Um, so by the way, it's my it's this, it's, it's this listening post that tell me something is interesting. That's my radar, right? Yeah. So I detect something in the radar. I identify the object, then I lock the target and say, okay, I need to pursue this generative AI thing. So now how do I pursue it in the in the best possible way? So I became familiar with it around November, December, December. And by March, we were having a conversation that we should launch an executive program on generative AI. So we put a stake in the ground and said, in July, we are going to launch an executive program on generative AI. Now, did I know any anything about generative AI? No. Uh, did I have to learn everything from scratch? Yes, but... It was a challenge that I took on saying, okay, I'm going to learn this stuff. Not only am I going to learn it, I'm going to learn it enough to teach it all within the space of three months. And we did it. We did it in, in July. And, and I think that there are three lessons that are embedded within this case study that I shared with you. One, create these early warning signal listening posts, right? Build your radar so that you can identify, oh, there's something going on in my profession, my job, my domain that is new, that is different. And the second thing is make a proactive commitment to actually reinventing yourself and moving in that direction, pivoting. And third is put some sort of a forcing deadline that says by, and in fact, you know, I sometimes tell people, leave your job. You know, yeah. cut, cut, cut yourself off from the, the umbilical cord or the safety cord because that really forces you to reinvent yourself on an aggressive time frame. So I think this is one encapsulation of what I try to do in my life and I've done it for several years. I'm, I tell myself if, if every five years, if I'm doing the same thing I was doing five years ago, then I've become irrelevant. So um, thank you very much. Actually, I was in part of a small group who was... Um, privilege to be with you in India in March mm -hmm. and uh, we went to you broke us to India as part of an uh, kilo executive MBA elective called Tech Mentor India and uh, throughout the trip like you were I could really see you um, laser focused on generative AI wherever we went like you talked about generative AI and um as you say, it, like we were, like it's Kellogg. I believe we may be the first institution or even school, like launching a generative AI program. And it was honestly, from a student perspective, uh, it was great like, to be part of it and um, to observe you. And uh, thank you very much talking about like your mindset. And we could see this mindset in motion. So we were really lucky to be around around you during that trip. Very cool. Um, I want to come back to India because we, during that tech venture India, uh, I will say field trip, in which we went to Delhi and Bangalore and met the leading minds of, of India. 
and uh, we met your f- cohort friends like from IIT Delhi. Yeah. And, and it's not going to be a problem in exaggeration that IIT Delhi is running India, right? <laughs> so um, what made you to um, want to come to the US and pursue like in, in, in this career rather than staying in India? Um, what triggered back this uh, decision? Probably there were some sliding door moments like in, in your life. Uh, what triggered you to come to the U.S. rather than staying in, in India? So I think to set the context here, you have to go back a few years in, in history. Right? The India that you saw in 2023 was very, very different from the India that I was uh, ex- it was available to me in 1985 when I graduated from IIT Delhi with my engineering degree. At that time, if you looked at technology companies or the role of technology, the sector in India, it was minimal. I mean, yes, Microsoft was in India at that time, but it was the sales office. You know, all the companies that were operating in India were basically seeing India as a minor market and um, so the opportunity that you had as an engineer was to either work on very incremental stuff or or to be in a sales role because there was no R&D being done here by multinationals. Yes, there were some local companies, but in the state of the, the technology sector uh, and the state of innovation was very, very constrained. We were also at that time still running on the socialist model of the economy where there was a lot of protectionism. So multinational companies were not free to operate in India. So the flow of of, of, of talent, the flow of technology, the flow of innovation uh, from the West was highly constrained. That began to change in 1992. So really, if if we wanted to broaden our horizons, if we wanted to work on more interesting and exciting problems, there was no choice except to to, to come to the United States. And um, so I finished my MBA, and uh, after I finished my MBA, I, I realized I wanted to learn more, I wanted to do more, and the opportunities were quite limited in, in India. So that what that is what brought me for my PhD mm-hmm. uh, to to Penn to to the Wharton School. Um, if you ask me, did I want to be an academic? Did I want to do research in technology? No, I had no idea. It was uh, <laughs> I joke that there was just the only way I could get a free ticket to come to the United States was to do a PhD because the PhD came with a scholarship and this, and I had no money. So I showed up here, and I had no idea what to expect as, as, as in, in, in a PhD program. And then slowly, as I started to understand what research is and, and also started to teach, I, I found that, yeah, this is something I could uh, be doing for a, for, a, for a lifetime. So um, I sometimes say that most strategy is constructed in hindsight, So you look back and say, well, I made a strategic decision to do this. No, it wasn't that way. I was kind of rolling along, stumbling along, but uh, at the same time kind of had this weak signal of opportunity guiding me to say, ah, this seems to be something interesting I want to explore. And then one one thing led to another. And uh, although I've never worked as an engineer, you know, from day one, I actually did an MBA and then I've worked in uh, in academia. But now, a lot of the work that I do is with technology companies. So even though I don't remember my electrical engineering, uh, I know the language and I know how to have conversations with tech companies. So in a way, it has all come full circle and served me well. So not a very linear path, not a very planned path, but uh, it was a case of constantly asking myself what's next and where do I see opportunities um, and that's led me to a good place. And it seems that your reinvent yourself constantly mindset having good like overlap with uh, academia and the path like you had and brought you here and now as a role model for um, many immigrant professionals like in in the US and many of course including Indian uh, immigrant professionals and now you showed us like in India when we were there um, which is as you mentioned not where you started 
and the confidence level and the innovation level in India, it's arguably, um, it has the most innovative entrepreneur you'll see in the world, like uh, in nowadays, right? Right. What would be your advice, like for um, Mohammed Sanis in the making, like especially uh, Indian diaspora professionals, like in 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 the United States? Uh, I know there's no like one size fits all type of mm-hmm. advice, but there's so much going on in India. Um, what is it possible like to for you to give like an advice like to them um, based on where India is right now? Or you may decide not to answer this question too. No, no, I think it's a very good question. Um, oh. So again, going back to my youth on the early days of the eighties. Entrepreneurship was not an option at all. I mean, the only companies that existed at that time were uh, the legacy family companies, you know, the Birlas, the Tatas, the, you know, the Godrej and so on. So you you kind of had to have a family business if you wanted to um, do anything. So the concept of risk capital, venture funding, entrepreneurship was I've never never even heard of it when I was, you know, in my twenties. That has changed dramatically now. So today you have kids and you met some of them, kids coming out of IIT, you know, with no fear, with no fear, with with a lot of ambition. And it's not like we didn't have ambition, but we just didn't have the infrastructure. We didn't have the ecosystem in place. And more importantly, we didn't have any role models of people who had done it in the past. But now, when somebody graduates from IIT at age 22 or 21, they look at 107 unicorns in the country, and many of them are their seniors, people who when they went to college with, or so, and they see that they have created enormous value, they've built big companies. Uh, so the opportunity landscape is vast. The role models are in existence, and the entrepreneurial ecosystem and infrastructure exists to get risk capital and so on. So, and the and the consequence of this is that failure is no big deal. Right. For us, 40 years ago, you needed job security. That was the number one thing. You needed to be in a safe job because jobs were scarce. Opportunity was scarce. But now, you know, your company goes under, so what? You'll form another company. Or you'll go work for a startup or you'll work for a big tech company. There's just so much opportunity. So my recommendation, my advice to the young people today or even the MBAs or the Indian diaspora is, is jump right in, right? The, the, the world is your oyster. There is so much entrepreneurial opportunity. India is a huge market. And not only is it a huge market, but as you, as you learned when we were in India, the infrastructure that has been put in place, combination of the India stack that the government has done, including you know the UPI and the uh, you know the 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 uh, Aadhaar and so on, identity and payments and so on, they built the infrastructure, and then top surrounding that is the wireless infrastructure that companies like Reliance Geo have built, which provides now connectivity and access to to everybody. So all the building blocks are in place. Uh, it, there's a huge market. The infrastructure exists. The um, uh, you know funding exists. So I would say, take a risk now. Take a chance. Build something new. And uh, instead of working for a large employer in a safe job, this is your ch- chance early in your in, in your life to be able to take the risk. So I think it's a, never been a better time to be an entrepreneur. Even if you're in the diaspora, it's never been a better time to consider going back and uh, working uh, on creating the next venture there because I think a lot of really interesting companies are going to come out of India over the next five years. And the amazing parts, amazing aspect of India is the infrastructure is now ready and you solve a problem and then you solve it at scale and you can really right. scale it up to 1.4 billion people right. and that actually creates opportunities for diaspora members too who may be considering going back. I think... I was going to ask you about like what the entrepreneurial mindset should be in general. Uh, and I, I believe you partially mentioned that like in your answer. Mm-hmm. So I want to move on to um, mm-hmm. business education and how it's changing. So business schools um, 
as a recent graduate, I think the business school targets of like business school participants are also changing. But I think one component like still remains, you come to a business school in order to become, rise up the ranks in corporate world mm -hmm. and become like a C-level executive like one day. And uh, it is very attractive to become like a C-level executive, especially at a large uh, corporation. Mm -hmm. And you see uh, these people like day in and day out in different programs. What is your general advice for, what should be the mindset of the people who want to rise up the ranks in the business world mm -hmm. uh, after the business school. Yeah, so so this is a different journey that that we're talking about now, which is uh, a corporate career yeah. and rising in the corporate world as opposed to the entrepreneurship path that we talked about earlier. So I think to to rise to the in in the corporate world again, the it goes back to the earlier discussion we were having about relevance of your skills and your skill set. So you have to understand and identify the growth areas and growth opportunities and the skills that will be in demand, the jobs that will be in demand. And by the way, with, with this whole generative AI uh, storming the landscape, a lot of jobs will actually become irrelevant or will become less relevant. So you have to now ask yourself, in a world that is driven by AI, in a world that is driven by digital technologies, uh, what sorts of careers and jobs would be highly valued? Uh, and you want to position yourself proactively to acquire those skill sets. Uh, so getting ahead in a corporate career, getting climbing that corporate career, first uh, uh, the recommendation I'd have is to, is, to, is to make sure that you understand where the emerging opportunities are and what are the types of jobs that actually like low-level coding or you know, uh, low-level marketing creative uh, design or and so on will become um, replaced by AI, right? But that's on the, what I'd call the hard skills and the functional skills side. There's also something that I think Kellogg does a particularly good job at, and that's something else you need to think about as you, as you grow, is to build your soft skills, is to build your, uh, your, your sort of EQ or your... Uh, you know, ability to work, collaborate, and ultimately lead people. So that's another area that I would say that if you want to get ahead in a corporate job, you have to figure out how you evolve from an IC, from an individual contributor to sort of a team leader. Uh, and this involves uh, developing skills like effective delegation and mentoring and uh, you know, collaboration, negotiation, executive presence, being able to actually convince senior leaders of your point of view. Uh, so communication skills, negotiation skills, uh, collaboration skills, uh, these uh, presentation skills, storytelling skills, these are something else that you need to pay attention to, particularly as you get past the first few layers of your organization, because that's what's going to reward you in uh, general management roles. So those are sort of two domains of advice that I can offer as you think about getting ahead in the corporate world. And there again, I'd, I would say, uh, apply the first principle that I talked about even in that context, that uh, in your corporate job, in your corporate setting, uh, don't, don't be doing the same thing for five years. Yeah. Proactively look for change, look for uh, new opportunities. And there I'll, 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 I'll share a story with you, which, uh, which I think has a very, it's a true story where a Kellogg uh, um, alum it illustrates a principle that I think a lot of MBAs should be following but don't. You know, what tends to happen with MBAs is um, when they graduate, there are the usual jobs, right? Consulting, big tech, these, this, between the two of them, they absorb half of our class. So there's a student of mine, his name is Aditya. He, he came to my office eight years ago and he said, um, I want to figure out what to do with my, you know, I have this offer and uh, it is with Nissan. And... Um, it's 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 a company I'm very excited about the automotive industry. I love the company, but they are asking me to 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 do production management in the factory in Tennessee in Nashville. <laughs> I'm gonna be in the plant for the next two years. And he says that's like it's in the middle of nowhere. It's I'm gonna be working in the factory. 
uh, is this something I should do? Is this something I should take? Because ultimately what I want to do is to, you know, I, I did my MBA in marketing out here. So I said, do it. I said, because I joked with him, I said that uh, companies want two types of people, people who can build stuff and people who can sell stuff. I said, MBAs don't want to do either of those. They don't want to be in production. They don't want to be in sales. They want to be in strategy, right? They want to be in marketing. So I said, you, if you spend two years in that factory in Nashville, will know more about manufacturing and the plant, and you'll have a unique competitive advantage. I said, how many MBAs are in that factory? He says, two, right? It's so, so he did that. He went and kind of paid his dues and uh, learned the nuts and bolts of how cars actually get built. And then a couple of years ago, I heard from him, and he was running the entire Infinity brand in North America. He had been promoted. And now he's just moved to Stellantis, and he's in India now, responsible for their entire uh, portfolio in the country. So, so I think the moral of the story here is, um, you know, do the dirty work. Yeah. Get your hands dirty. Don't be afraid of, uh, you know, working in sales or working in, you know, any job that's close to a customer or close to your manufacturing or production is not very popular, but that is what will really teach you mm -hmm. um, and position you. So we tend to want to get into strategy positions so quickly as MBAs that we forget that uh, first there's operations and first there's sales and first there's production. So try to get those diverse experiences. Also try to get experiences around the, the world. You know, try to get international. Uh, and there, of course, I have a vested interest in saying, if you haven't worked in India, you have missed out on something. So try to get an assignment that takes you there. So really try to kind of, you know, move around. Um, make yourself uncomfortable, learn more. And that's what's going to help you grow. So along these lines, um, you work closely with innovators right both on corporate side also on the startup startup side you advise companies and organizations with almost endless resources and also with very limited resources right and um what are the most exciting collaborations uh, and projects like in your view on that like corporate side and the startup side so far well, on the corporate side, um, you know, I've been, as you know, uh, on the board of directors for Reliance Geo since 2015, and that has been an exhilarating journey because they, you know, on the corporate side, as you said, unlimited resources. Yes, <laughs> it took about 35 billion dollars in capital to create that 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 company, but what they have built uh, is. I think there's no other company like it in the world in terms of the scale, the quality of the technology, the radical affordability of the you know, solutions that they've created, the data solutions. So uh, working with the leadership team, you know, mentoring the team and, and being part of that journey has been really, really exciting. I would also single out my work with Microsoft. Um, I have been doing capability development and strategy workshops and, and uh, advising for uh, since 2001. So it's almost 22 years unbroken every single year because we run a bunch of capability development programs for them. So that has been a great journey to watching the evolution of the company beyond the PC and Windows you know, paradigm to the cloud and now through AI uh, has been fascinating. I've learned a lot from them. So I on the corporate side, the big technology companies, um, you know, I've also really enjoyed my work with Salesforce, my work with Adobe, and so on. And then on the startup side, it's uh, it's a variety of really interesting startups. By the way, a lot of them have failed, as, as startups do. So over the past probably 20 years, I'm, I've been associated with maybe 30 or 40 startups in various capacities, advisory capacities. And and I think in there, in that in that case, it's it's about really getting excited about the specific problems that they're solving, the specific use cases that they're working on. For instance, there's a company that um, where I'm on their board, actually, it's a startup company, and they are redefining uh, ethnographic research and qualitative research 
um, by using AI, but also now using telemetry. They're actually putting sensors into uh, into the home, which detect where, what, you know, how much toothpaste you've consumed, or how many laundry, how much laundry detergent you've consumed. So you have consumption intelligence. So understanding how they're putting AI and telemetry to use in in the context of customer research and shopper research is, is that's fascinating. Similarly, a firm out of Israel called LogEeks that is using uh, artificial intelligence to um, uh, to create uh, uh, automated contract review for legal documents and the working with general counsels to automate the process. So liberating lawyers from the, the mundane tasks. Uh, or the company that we visited, VVMark in India, which is built a smart career platform, which actually a lot of the Kellogg people actually use for their resumes and for interviews. So... Um, it's a variety of things. I think it's in the startup context, to me, what is exciting about the collaborations is the diversity uh, of them. It's not like one particular company, but sort of the portfolio. But in the big tech companies, my deep engagement with a few leading companies over the years that uh, has really taught me a lot. You brought um, a global perspective. I, I think not broke. You are constantly bringing a global perspective in to everything you are involved in. Mm -hmm. So um, what is the importance of like this global involvement um, in the way how you teach uh, business at, at Kellogg? You, yeah, I think that knowledge knows no geographical frontiers and uh, neither do businesses nor do products. So I think we really need to think of the world as our playground and our laboratory and our and our market, but uh, obviously there are a lot of uh, challenges and uh, uh, risks of operating globally. Markets are different, regulations are different. Building out distribution and sales organizations across the world uh, is not easy. So. Uh, so I think that global means different things for different companies, and it may take different amounts of time. Now, what is interesting about some of the technology companies, take a company like Dropbox, you know, and they can be global from day one because nothing needs to change and their product is in the cloud. Or on the other hand, if I'm building a, you know, if I'm Tesla, Global is a much more deliberate process because I actually have to build factories and I have to build supply chains and build components. And so I have to think very carefully about do I go into China, do I go into Germany, do I go into India? So um, so I think it depends a little bit on whether you're playing in atoms or playing in bits um, and, uh, and what is your scale. And sometimes you can actually overdo global. We saw, for instance, Uber in its early days very quickly expanded into more than 100 countries and then quickly realized that they couldn't compete on so many fronts. They withdrew from China, they withdrew from Singapore, they withdrew from Turkey, you know, from Turkey yeah. they, and they withdrew from uh, Latin America. Um, and they have refocused on a smaller set of markets and have gone deeper. So, so I think globalization is something that is a good North Star. It's a good goal for any organization, as well, also for any individual as an executive. Um, but at the same time, I see a lot of mistakes being made because it seems just because a market is big uh, doesn't mean that uh, it's relevant. When we're talking about Turkey, uh, just yesterday I was talking to my colleague Sanjay Kosla and he was on the board at Best Buy and Best Buy entered Turkey. Yeah. And uh, and he said, I was on the board asking the CEO, why are we in Turkey? He said, it's big. And he said, yeah, but <laughs> do we have any right to play and a right to win? So best buy withdrew from Turkey, right? So you have to be careful. I think uh, sometimes so global is being global and being present around the world is a uh, good north star and is a obviously a good opportunity, but at the same time it, it needs to be thought through very carefully because there are a lot of companies that have failed in their their their, their aspiration to be global. I have two more questions. Mm -hmm. um, one is. What is the Kellogg impact on your life? Hmm. Well, I, I think there's a reason that uh, Kellogg was my first job and I stayed here for 30 years. Um, that's because I find this to be a great place in terms of the student body, the faculty, and also the you know the collaborative 
culture and the environment. Uh, at this stage in my career, what I need is a place that actually serves as a good platform for allowing me to do all the work that I do. And Kellogg is a fantastic platform. You know, it has a great brand, a great alumni community, great executive education infrastructure, a great executive MBA program that just allows me to interact with 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 a very diverse set of very high quality audiences. Uh, as well as the faculty colleagues I have, as well as the administration and the dean. And so it's been good to me. And it's really kind of, you know, my professional career and Kellogg are intertwined and one and the same thing. And, you know, uh, I, I fully expect to retire from here and not go elsewhere. So that's uh, that, that's what's kept me uh, engaged. And I think if you can find one good place to, to, to hang on to, even though, by the way, you might say that you're violating your principle of reinventing yourself by changing jobs, okay. but I've been changing myself within the job. And that okay. that's what Kellogg allows me to do. And that's what I value, that I can reinvent myself. I can do different things. I can drive innovation okay. um, and still stay at the same place. So that's the best of both worlds. And with that, thank you very much. And how do you see the future of business education? Business education, I think, is poised for a uh, big disruption. There is a lot needs to change. Um, fundamentally, business education is becoming very, very expensive in the way that we, you know, want to do it in person and uh, high quality education. So we need to figure out how we democratize access and make education more accessible, more, more affordable, more convenient without compromising quality, without saying we're going to start offering online degrees. So, so, so one big change that I see that we need to, and we started on this at Kellogg, and what we need to push further is how do we leverage digital technology to improve the scale and lower the cost and increase the convenience of uh, executive education and, and, and an MBA education. So that's, you know, one theme. So for instance, in the executive MBA program, you know, I've created a course called Leading Product Organization, which is a hybrid, uh, which half of the content is done asynchronously, which you can do at your own pace and you don't need to travel. And the others are live sessions that we do virtually. So now suddenly my AMBA students don't need to travel for this course. Now, that doesn't mean they don't do the in-person stuff. They do those courses, but this is an add-on and, a, you know, that gives them an opportunity to take an elective uh, without the need to travel. And by the way, this can be offered globally. So in my leading product organizations course, I have students from all the campuses. So, so these are ways in which, you know, we're trying to look at how we can use technology, use blended learning approaches to, uh, to, to scale and provide access to, to business education to more people at an affordable cost. I think the other thing that we will see is that um, education will become probably more modular and more granular. So today, you take a, you know, our unit of analysis is a course or a degree, but at the end of the day, you need knowledge objects, you need specific competencies. So imagine if I'm just picking up microcredits for specific skills, and then those microcredits are adding up to a degree that is very flexible. By the way, those microcredits can come from my work experience. It can come from professional certifications. So sort of this flexible credentialing, uh, accumulating up to a degree is sort of an interesting notion. Uh, and the final thing I'll say is that, and this is very relevant for the executive MBA program, is that the way we have done global traditionally, which is we have a few very heavyweight alliances around the world, you know, uh, we have one in, you know, in, in, in Germany, we have one in uh, Tel Aviv and, and one in Toronto and so on. I think that model needs to be adapted to sort of create a more flexible, lightweight set of partnerships around the world where we can bring on-demand kind of pop-ups partnerships to uh, give these experiential learning uh, experiences to our uh, executive MBA students. So, so, for instance, with Tech Venture India, what did you get? You got sort of a deep immersion into a, you know, into a geography and into an industry. So uh, imagine if we created like 10 of these hubs around the world where you could go to, and I'm saying, in fact, we are we're, we're doing a partnership now, and I've facilitated that interaction, 
there is a course that uh, my colleague Greg Carpenter teaches on luxury marketing in uh, to his MBA co- uh, students. And I have a very good friend, Emanuela Prandelli in Bocconi, who is uh, the professor of luxury marketing in Italy. And she's on the board at Prada and a bunch of these companies. So I brought them together to create an executive MBA course that will be jointly taught between Bocconi and, uh, and, and, and Kellogg. And it will end with a immersion trip like Tech Venture India, except the Angba students will go to Italy and France for their experiential learning. So actually go visit these uh, fashion companies. And uh, so uh, so I think we need to become more creative and think about how can we build a virtual network of partnerships. That So those are some of the changes that I see coming to business education. Professor Sani, it's been an honor to have you on this podcast. And... The reason why we have this podcast is actually the inspiration I got in India. Uh, and if I didn't really go um, to India with you, I don't think that this podcast like will exist. And uh, it's really an honor to have you. Uh, thank you very much for your time. No, it's been uh, fascinating having this conversation with you. And I know that, uh, yes, uh, the Tech Venture India trip was a component of this, but your uh, your your dogged persistence and your initiative and the strong sense of passion that you bring to making this podcast happen has been uh, great to watch and I think you're doing a great service to the the community and I look forward to seeing the podcast in action as well as to many more episodes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for diving deep with us on another episode of Lehigh Low Ego High Impact Mindset. Join us every week as we discover the stories, strategies, and insights that will empower you to grow personally and professionally. Stay inspired and catch you in the next one.